make life a little bit easier. All right, hi folks. Um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about something that falls under the topic of nanotechnology, but uh, it sort of falls under a lot of topics, electronic devices, electronics, computers, all sorts of things. Um, the topic of the talk is playing pool with electrons, and I think where I might start... Yeah, got it. Is, uh, I'll start out with uh, what an electron is, just make sure we're all sort of in the same place. So electrons are the tiny negatively charged particles that orbit around nuclei and atoms. And it's exactly the stuff that comes out of the wall socket at home when you turn the power on. So a really good analogy here is to compare it to water. With water you've got, turn on the tap, water comes out, comes out as water molecules. Electricity, you turn on the switch and out comes electrons as a stream, much like water does. So if you take your PlayStation, you've probably all now got PlayStation 3, so you can take your PlayStation 2 and destroy it. And if you pop open the lid, you'll see on, side, on the inside there's a whole pile of uh, circuits inside it. And if you could break your way into those circuits and have a look at the microscope, you'll find millions and millions of little devices on the inside. And if you can have a really close look at those devices, you'll find something that looks like this. It's called a transistor. And there's around about 50 million of these inside your average computer chip these days. So how does a transistor work? A transistor is really just a tap for electrons. So you can imagine that you would have a water tap at home, and when you turn the tap on, the water flows, and when you turn the tap off, the water stops flowing. A transistor is almost exactly the same idea. You have a flow of electrons coming through, and you can turn this sort of tap for electrons on and off. And the way we do it is not have sort of a plunger that goes up and down, but we use electrostatics. So you can imagine your transistor looks a little bit like this. Your flow of electrons comes in through here, goes through the um, silicon, and comes out the other side. And then the tap is this piece in the middle here called a gate. And if you have this gate just sitting there, then the tap is off and there's no electrons flowing through this device. And if you put a positive charge on this gate, then it attracts electrons into this region here and your tap is on. And so by switching this gate on and off, you can switch this flow of electrons on and off and that's how you get your ones and your zeros that you use to represent information in a computer. So if we have a look at uh, progress in electronics, um, you guys are pretty fortunate you've grown up with uh, computers probably all of your lives, but if I remember back to when I was a very young boy, um, in schools, we just, were just getting our first computers turning up. They looked a little bit like this, and they had green television screens, and you couldn't really do much with them at all. And over the years, we've been able to pack more and more transistors into computer chips, making them smaller and smaller as we go along, until we get to now where we sort of have, you know, billions of uh, transistors on each chip, and we can do proper computing these days. We have things like the internet, you can see me here on the other side of of the state talking to you. So everyone knows that uh, computers are really about games and, and not much <laughs> else, and so you can, you can basically have a look at the evolution of computer games in much the same way. So you can start out with something really lame and old like Pong, where you just have these two tennis rackets moving up and down the screen. Uh, my personal favourite was the Atari 2600, which had Space Invaders and Pac-Man. And then you can sort of move your way through with more and more transistors on chip to being able to do stuff that's really interesting, like have PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 3, which many of you probably have at home already. So one of the problems that we have with putting more and more transistors on a chip is heat. And it's becoming a real problem for us now. Back in the old days where the computers didn't have too many transistors in them, they put out a little bit of heat, but it didn't matter very much. You could put your computer inside a box and have a little cooling fan on the back, and it would work quite happily. If you take your computer now and you pop open the lid, you'll find that the chip's sitting there, and it's got a great big cooling system off the top of it. Some of them have a, a giant fan. Some of them even have radiators running on them these days. And if we try to put more and more transistors on the chip, this is going to become a really big problem. We're sort of at the stage now where a computer chip puts out as much heat as a hot plate, and and I had a video, but I can't get it to run, um, where you can put an egg on top of a computer chip without the heating, uh, without a cooling fan on it. You can actually cook that egg in, a, in the space of about 10 minutes. And if we put more transistors on, eventually we will have so much heat coming out that uh, the chip will melt itself and the computer won't work anymore. It won't be terribly satisfactory to buy a computer and have it melt a couple of days later. This has already become a really big problem and the heat comes from the fact that 
Um, what we have to do is we have to pass electrical currents through these transistors and we also have to put charge on and off this gate here in order to um, make the transistor work. And the problem with that, it's much like your light globe at home, when you have current passing through something, it puts out heat, okay? And the same happens here, when you put more and more of these transistors together, you've got a whole pile of warm bodies all together and it puts out a large amount of heat. So what we're really focused on working on is how to solve this problem, because if we want to have better and better computer technologies, we need to overcome this problem to be able to put more transistors together. There's one way to do it, which is to have better cooling, and people are even um, doing some really interesting things with uh, putting giant cooling mechanisms on computers, and so some of you might have heard of people called overclockers. Um, what they like to do is take existing computer chips and run them faster than they should go by putting really good cooling systems on them. And so you can see one here that's actually being run by liquid nitrogen just to keep it nice and cold. But it doesn't work too far, it doesn't work too well, and it's not terribly great for laptops, right? You can imagine that uh, if you want to go travel somewhere with your laptop, you have to have a, a giant cooling stack, or you have to carry liquid nitrogen around with you, it's not going to work terribly well. And so the approach we're taking is to completely redesign um, the transistor in the hope that we overcome this heating problem. And so one way we want to do this is we want to use a different property of the electron in order to do our information, our ones and zeros. So at the moment, the way you have a zero and a one that tells your computer something about information is that you either have electrons flowing through or you have electrons not flowing through, right? And when they're flowing through, they're producing heat, and that's our problem. There's another property that you have for an electron, and it's known as spin. And you can imagine the electron to be a little bit like a tiny cricket ball. You can make it spin one way, and you can make it spin the other way, okay? There's like a clockwise spin and an anti-clockwise spin. In physics, we tend to call them spin up and spin down, because you can imagine that if it spins in one direction, if it's pointing up, it's clockwise, and if it's pointing down, then it's going anti-clockwise. And so you can imagine that one day, um, we can use these spins to make computers, and you might buy a computer that has, you know, for example, spins inside or something like that. So how are we going about doing this? Um, the idea that we're kind of playing with is to try and bounce electrons off walls and use their spin to determine which way they go. Um, the real aspects of this come down to some quantum mechanics, which is probably something that you'll learn if you stay on to university. But to give you an analogy for it, you can imagine it's a little bit like Shane Warne playing cricket, right? So if the ball spins one way, it will hit a surface and it will move in one direction. And if the ball spins the other way, it will hit a surface and it will move in the other direction. And so what we want to be able to do is to have spins come into a transistor that we shape in some way, we bounce them off a wall, and based on whether they're spinning upwards or downwards, we can make them go in different directions. And this will allow us to have our information, our ones and zeros, and be able to do logic with it. So we're just at the moment just starting to work with how you actually make these things move around. Um, it'll be a long time before we start doing logic and have them turn up in computers, but that's the nature of research. <coughs> 